Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hello, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with Dan Hannum, the COO of Zen Ledger. And also, uh, it sounds like you were one of the early investors in Zen Ledger, too. Is that right? Yeah, Monica, thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be on. And yeah, we, uh, we originally invested in, in Zen Ledger back in 2017, actually. So it's uh, one of our first investments through our first fund. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. So one of the first investments, how did you decide that they were such a good investment for you guys? Yeah, yeah. I think we highlighted a little bit of what we look for in investments on, on our last episode, which would be nice for, for guests if they want to explore deeper into you know what we look for when we invest. But they, they kind of met a lot of our, our thresholds or our checklist of having a great team, having a great product, having a product that you know we would need or we would use, which I think you know is always a, a nice telltale sign if you have an early cohort of people that really need something um, and kind of see the, the value and. Um, so that was kind of some of the, the, the main things is just, you know, is this something that will people will use? Will people need this? Um, and I think that's the nice part about our business is um, if you're a U.S. based uh, investor, you need to file your crypto tax report. So we kind of yeah, have that Yeah, that's one thing I was marks. taught as a kid. Like, you know, yeah. you're always, <laughs> hey, the two things that are taxes. certain is death and taxes. So you've, yeah. you've gotten into good, that and toilet paper. You know, you could also, I would say, you have the similar stability in toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we'll see if we can branch out a little bit. Um, but yeah, so that was just like, it, it made a ton of sense. It was something that I was uh, currently facing. I had, you know, Excel docs and Google spreadsheets and like handwritten notes. And it was just like such a, a duh type moment. Like, yeah. you know, crypto tax will continue to evolve. We'll need software that can handle this and spit out your tax forms easy. Um, and then, yeah, yeah. the team and, was great and the valuation was great as well. Well, and it sounds like you, you, got, uh, you got on board actually. So after investing, you kind of started in around what, a year, year and a half-ish ago. And you, uh, you started getting involved, kind of getting your hands dirty in this. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Zen Ledger was raising a, a seed round uh, about like 14, 15 months ago. Um, and, you know, Pat, uh, the CEO of the company was, was, you know, looking and speaking with the current round of investors of, you know, hey, do you know anyone who'd be interested, etc. Um, so through that process, you know, it, it became clear that I could add a lot of value and bring in uh, not only additional, you know, fundraising, um, but then also it became evident that the company would need kind of a COO position to help you know, once the capital came in, we needed to grow and scale dev team, marketing team, sales team, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I was just, just kind of looking average, for- Just the average, like how you just kind of scale a business when, in the early days yeah. when you're going to be like, okay, we have three people. Soon let's be six. <laughs> and then we'll be much. 12. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it grows fast. But yeah, I, th I think there's just like a time where, where the CEO um, has to relinquish the title of doing everything and bring in people that can focus on aspects of the business so that he or she can then focus on other aspects of the business that are more important um, and, and structure and organization and operations is something that, that needs to happen, but it's not the most glamorous or, or you know, sexy item. Um, so sometimes it's better to have the CEO focus on fundraising or, you know, where we're going with the product and then have someone who can kind of handle, you know, the day to day in addition to the, the macro of where the company is going. So, um, so yeah, it was, it's been really exciting to jump on board and, and that's kind of the things that I love is putting that structure and organization in place and seeing how, we can scale the company and organization efficiently. So you talk about scaling. Well, um, and it sounds to me like, you know, what you're really targeted to do is just to make it easier to be compliant. Can you give me like a simple example of what is the first headache that you felt like was solved for you personally when you were like, oh, hmm. this is actually, I can put my spreadsheets away now and my notes. And like, <laughs> what was the first like major headache for you that got solved? Yeah, I think it's it goes to the fragmentation of crypto. And I think that's something that we don't really see with with traditional equity markets. Um, for example, like the average investor may have like an E-Trade account or a TD Ameritrade account, but the, you know, they're logging on and they're just using that account. So all of their transactions are happening through one account. When they come in at the end of the tax year, they can, you know, the brokerage will provide you with your tax reports, and then you're kind of just done. Um, with crypto, because we're so early and so fragmented, there's, you know about four or 500 different exchanges. Um, 
So if you're using, you know, 10 or 20 or 30, you can't just print off one form at the end that shows you what happened in that because, you know, you're swapping tokens and assets between all of these different exchanges, totally. which, you know, muddles the cost basis of that. So that, I guess that was just the, the, the most impactful thing early on was realizing that you could track cost basis across multiple exchanges, multiple wallets. And that's really what we originally kind of built the, the company around is providing just a, a way to do that. And then we've been able to add on, you know, better UI, better UX, better pricing, better feature sets, et cetera. But I think that was the main thing is, is you know, I was using multiple exchanges and multiple wallets and trying to track where I put those funds to, where that went, where this went, how much yeah. it was at this time. It's like herding cats at some point. You know, I remember it's... when I finally kind of consolidated things and I was like, all right, you know, it's maybe about when Polynex was just like losing its feet. And I was just like, okay, I got to start really thinking this through. This is not the same as an equities market. This is not stable. This is new. This is speculative. All of it could just go away tomorrow. So I was like, okay, time to consolidate and get some, you know, clarity and get that spreadsheet out and all of that. So yeah. I know, I know what you mean. That was like, that was a tough little um, jump for me in, in my crypto life. But also I was very thankfully, I was, I, I picked only, about, I would say like five or six exchanges initially when I was like, oh, another, yeah. I'll try that. Oh, what's crack it? Like it was so <laughs> long ago when I finally pulled them all together. I was like, I don't ever need to go back unless I want to do like, you know, swap, tra like yeah. trading just based on like a tiny little spread. And I do not have time for that. So <laughs> I'm not going to I think, it. I think that's, but, the, that's the, that's the key though. I think it's just tracking your sources. Uh, I think that's something that is always like a question. Like, do I, if I get into crypto, do I need to track every single transaction? And it's like, no, but you need to, you know, like write down that you used a Kraken, a Poloniex, a, a Gemini, et cetera. Cause for us, as long as you have the source, we can pull in what happened in that source. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to pull that little disclaimer out there because I think it gets a little overwhelming for people who are like, I don't want to have to track every single transaction. It's, you know, as long as you know what sources or what wallets you use, our software can really kind of uh, match what happened in between them for you. Oh, that's great. And it sounds like you guys are also really supporting uh, DeFi and uh, non-fungible tokens in a way that a lot of folks are just not really kind of top of their class. Can you tell me a little bit about specifically how you define DeFi differently? Yeah. How you personally like distinguish it as separate. And also um, for our listeners out there that don't know what non-fungible tokens are, I'd love to hear um, what your definition is. And also a couple of examples of ones that you, uh, that you could, that you can point people to, to kind of research and learn more on, in, on the ground. Sure. Sure. Um, so I guess to, to answer the first question first uh, on the DeFi side, I think DeFi in general just stands for decentralized finance. And, and really the, the goal there is to cut out middlemen and cut out um, rent seekers in the process. The, the the thing is, I don't think we, we've gotten there yet. I think we still have a bunch of middlemen. We still have a bunch of processes, but that's kind of like the, the goal is to cut out the banks, cut out the brokerage firms, et cetera, and just allow peers to, to trade back and forth between uh, each other. Um, so kind of DeFi, the way that I would separate that is really from a centralized exchange perspective versus a decentralized exchange. So yeah. on the centralized exchange, you'd have like a Coinbase where you have like Brian Armstrong and a CEO and a board of executives and like, 5 million employees and like all that stuff. And then you have like on the deck side, you have like a Uniswap, which still has like a leader, but has maybe three or five people. And like their entire platform is built around smart contracts, which allow peers to, to operate. So I guess that's kind of like the way we look at things is from like a centralized versus a decentralized perspective. Yeah, totally. But I, I still don't think we're like, quote unquote, really decentralized just yet. Um, and then on the NFT side or non-fungible token side, I guess the way that I would define that is uh, fungibility just means uh, kind of like swappability. Um, so like a dollar is a fungible asset. My dollar at the grocery store is still the same dollar at the gas station. It's like the dollar is a dollar regardless of where it is. A uh, non-fungible token, which, which basically would add scarcity to a digital uh, asset or a digital item. Um, so if you wanted to have like a one out of a one. So for example, like a, a really easy one is like sports memorabilia. Um, if you wanted to know that you're like one out of one Babe Ruth baseball card um, is just one, it's a lot easier to, to track that on a blockchain than it is with, uh, with traditional methods. Like, for example, we see a lot of counter, uh, counterfeit items in sports memorabilia because you can print off a logo and then like slap it on to a picture and say it's real and no one can really tell the difference. So yep. anyways, uh, the non fungible token essentially just means that you're adding digital scarcity to an asset that typically would be able to be transferred without that same level of uh, one for one matching, I, I so guess. So like the opposite happened when uh, we went in March, when suddenly the Fed just like, we just um, started printing money. That would be 
definitely absolutely making the US dollar the furthest thing from a non-fungible token. There is not scarcity built into that into that thing. It's more just like print more, print more, let them use it, let's hope it works out. Very different than the non-fungible token approach. The non-fungible token approach would be like, it's losing value, it's losing value. There's not very many of them. When somebody finally sees a scarcity, maybe it'll gain value. Let it go. We'll just see what happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think like the, the uniqueness is like the, the interesting part because like the dollar can still go down to no value, but your, your dollar is still like a dollar either way you go. So I think like the, the non-fungible element is like that, you know, that asset, whether it's like a trading card or a crypto kitty is an, ex an example of like a bigger NFT. Um, the, like the value could still go to zero, but like there's still only that one, crypto kitty there's not nine million other dollars so i think there's a lot of analogies in there but okay um so yeah and i think that those are two exciting parts on on the crypto side because you know they introduce another element of, of being able to track the cost basis of those things and track you know how you're receiving income some of these non-fungible tokens grant and that's, you access that's specifically to like how perks. you are um providing tax support to DeFi nfts non-fungible tokens as well as just run of the mill crypto here and there, people with multiple exchanges, people that have been like, I've been doing this. I don't really know how to be compliant. Uh oh, I'm just going to hope nobody knows I'm doing this. I think the more years that go by, the more trouble I might be. And I'm just not, just not sure. Cause I know that there was um, a box on the most recent tax form sent out that was like right at the top. Do you own yeah. any cryptocurrencies? And um, yeah. that, that's a big, that's a big step. I mean, that's what was like, came out what for 2000, 2019 um, taxes I mean, gosh, with Bitcoin having been around for 10 years, it took them a long time to figure it out. But uh, well, now that they have, they've cracked that, they've cracked that whip. So here we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, uh. we're seeing a, a ton of like increased, even like even that question has gone from 2019 was on the schedule one, which is like not to get too into details, but like a form within the 1040. So yeah. it, it wasn't required for every tax uh, payer, just if you met certain standards. Now in 2020, it's on the top of the 1040, which every U.S. American files. So like mm -hmm. even that change from like kind of like form two or three to the top of form one for uh, 2020 is going to be uh, pretty massive. We think in the adoption rate of, of people that are the compliance rate, excuse me, uh, of people that are in crypto who are actually filing. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of amazing. Um, and I noticed that you talked, you said something that I was trying to understand better. And I've sold real estate. I've invested in real estate. I have, you know, I, I know these markets quite well and, and I'm investing in the stock market, but I'm wondering how is it that crypto is taxed like real property? Like, is it like this ordinary income or is it taxed like a house? You know, you said it's, it's a thing. And I was trying to understand how, even if you lose money, you can still end up taxed on crypto where it's, that's not the case if you have losses on a, a securities um, transaction. So in the stock market, yeah. if you put money, if you lose money and you sell, there's no tax event there. In the crypto yeah. market, apparently there is. Yeah, yeah, happy to dive in. I think it goes back to the IRS and how they treat crypto. So really, the, the, the first guidance that came out was back in 2014 and, and actually called 2014-21. Um, if you just like go on, on Google, you can read exactly what they came out with. But like to think that that was already six years ago, we really haven't had much guidance since then. But anyways, to get back to the point, uh, the, the reason why the 2014-21 was so valuable is they treated crypto as property instead of a commodity, a security um, a stock, a bond, uh, et cetera. So by classifying it as property, that's what creates a lot of the, the, the what we referred to earlier, like the cost basis tracking um, is typically with a security, you can have like a like kind exchange. Um, but with, with crypto, you can't because you're essentially selling a piece of property and buying another one instead of swapping two identical pieces. Um, so that it just creates a lot of challenges. But, you know, as you mentioned, um, the, the capital gains is just something, I guess the biggest thing or takeaway is that any crypto to crypto transaction has a taxable element to it. Um, and I think that's what creates not only like the, the, the difficulty in tracking those things, but can add to the confusion of, uh, of the difference between a capital gain or capital loss, a short-term capital gain or capital loss, and then just regular income that you're earning in crypto. So it's it definitely but it also adds means that, I mean, the takeaway here is that like crypto is taxed higher than your regular income. It's taxed higher than your equities and securities, it's taxed higher than your short-term gains, it's taxed higher than your long-term gains, it's taxed higher than, it's the most highly taxed asset class available to a U.S. investor. Is that correct? I, I mean, I would say so. Yeah, especially with the way that it's currently treated. And that's the thing, if we, you know, in the next two or three or five years, if we have more of these that are actually, you know, uh, classified as securities, then those get, you know, treated as securities, which gives you more flexibility, more, um, I guess, rights or, uh, 
uh, optionality to handle taxes in different ways. And I think the the thing is, like you know, as we talked about, the IRS has really not provided additional guidance in 60 years. So they've yeah. provided small guidance, but still, you know, maybe in 2021 or 2022, they come out and say, hey, this really shouldn't be a property. We don't believe that it should be counted as a property um, in itself. Um, but yeah, so I think as the IRS continues to learn more about crypto, what it is, how it's being used, et cetera, I think we'll see updated guidance over the, yeah. the next 12 or 18 months. And yeah, you know, I agree. with that guidance, we could see better uh, clarity and then better um, optionality of how to handle uh, your, your taxes as well. Well, I, it sounds like you know a lot about how everyone should handle their taxes, but in terms of Zen Ledger and like your expertise, which I mean, you come from a pretty high level hedge fund management and founding to pretty in the weeds, in the tiny little details, knowing every single thing about, I mean, wow, you're basically an accountant without a CPA, um, <laughs> without a license. But yeah. what are the one to two things that you think um, our audience members just need to have, need to know about crypto and being compliant and the intersection with taxation in America at this point? And I realize we do have listeners overseas and I apologize, this is so um, US based, but we are really focusing on US tax this time. So what, do you have any like, I don't know, specifics that you're like, oh, everybody asks me that. This is, oh my God, this is, uh, I have to answer this one again. What would, what would be the most helpful? I think we touched on like the, the biggest one. It's just that like, like the, the ETH to X to Z or like uh, a crypto to crypto transaction is taxable. I think that's one that just, it takes a little bit to get your head around, especially because we have a lot of people that come from a securities background or yeah. they've invested in stocks and they're like, wait, that doesn't really make sense. Um, so I think that's a big one. And I think the, the other one is just that uh, it's it's so much easier to be compliant now than it was back in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. And I think one of the big things that we take very seriously is being able to provide a lot of people um, the comfort that they need to get into this asset class. Um, yeah. And going back to 2015 or 2016, there's a lot of people that had, you know, very high, high net worth individuals that just didn't really want to bother with crypto because they, they didn't want to get audited. They didn't want people digging through their K1s and their W2s and their real estate and all that other stuff. And they're like, yeah, I can make some money, but it's not worth it. Totally. There's, there's no more excuse now. Like you can put money in as much as you want, put it wherever you want and use, you know, platforms like a Zen Ledger to just ingest your sources and then we'll spit out your tax forms for you. So I think that'd be the other thing is that um, I don't think, I think at one point compliance was a hindrance to crypto adoption. And I think from a tax perspective, it no longer is. We, we have software and tools and teams to, to really make sure that um, whether you're investing just in crypto or crypto and real estate and stocks and whatever, um, you can easily and quickly and accurately get in and out and be done. And I think that's that's uh, so an, important. an advantageous. Yeah. Yeah. That is so important. I mean, I, I realize that there are a lot of people that have wanted to be in crypto or they're curious about it. They, I've had friends call me from Amsterdam. I had a friend call me and say, you know, what's about this Bitcoin stuff? I, I, should <laughs> I get your book? Is that, is that what I should read? I'm not really sure. And I'm like, well, we can talk about it. And at least I can give them like why, why Bitcoin has a different relationship to value than yeah. other currencies. I can get them, you know, you can buy a fraction of it. You don't have to buy the entire amount. So don't worry about that part. I can yeah. get them on that part. I can tell them where the onboard, I'll say onboarding and off, offboarding, like on ramp and off ramp that can you know, send them in some directions for that. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not going to be someone's wealth management professional. And <laughs> if they start going, I can, okay, I'm going to at least like, but what did you trade in? And I'll be like, I don't know. Or if we go back and forth on that stuff, then maybe yeah. when they start trading now, that at least that headache will be taken away, you know, because with most people take that leap and not everybody has someone to tell them to take the leap. But once they do, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty important to make, maintain that they're like going to be compliant and not going to have that worry, you know, because like doing a new thing with money is, is doing a new thing with money. I mean, whether you're first getting oh, into yeah. real estate, first getting into equities, options, futures, whatever, you know, crypto is going to be that plus a lot of technology differences. And if the platforms aren't well put together and intuitive and beautiful like Zen Ledger, you're going to be like, ah, oh, never mind. I'm just going to not, not worry about it, which is not exactly the best way to go. So absolutely. No, I'm I think so you highlighted it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I think we offer, uh, you know, obviously I, I like to toot my horn every now and again, but I think we offer a valuable resource. And I think, you know, you highlighted some, another element that I think we feel strongly of is the education piece um, of just, you know, showing people how to get involved, how they can use things, um, how they can do it compliantly. Um, you know, when I first started, I think some of like the Bitcoin that I first bought was like off Craigslist. Like there, <laughs> there, there wasn't a Coinbase, like, Right. And I think people don't realize how far we've come in five years. Like, 
even back in 2015, there weren't like, you know, multiple exchanges where you could get better exchange rate. There's no competition on the the fees that you're paying. Like, so as we continue to build the infrastructure, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll continue to onboard more, more crypto users, but I think you highlighted a big piece. The compliance side is a big thing, but just the, the general education and awareness of how well, you can ease of use, get in. You know, yep. it's like compliance and ease of use equals onboarding and more people involved in crypto, which I feel like you're doing, you're fighting the good fight and I appreciate we're it trying. so much. We're trying. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you guys are doing. And uh, I got to, I got to figure out my, my relationship to Zen Ledger myself. I'm glad you guys are there because I've seen some you. tax places come and go. I've even interviewed them on this podcast. I can't say they're all gone or anything. You know, there are plenty that are doing great, but you guys, it's a new space and there's a lot of open, open space for you guys all to compete and to, to add value to the ecosystem. So I just want to say thank you for helping to bring more people into the crypto space. We need them. We need interest there. We need people to know what blockchain is. And that's awesome. So thank you so much, Dan. Do you have anything else you'd like to leave us with before we sign off? Um, no, I'm good. I mean, thank you. I, I think you've done an amazing job, you know, w- with with your podcast over the last few years of giving people like me the platform to to show people that you know crypto has tools and resources and sh- you know is worthwhile to explore into. So I appreciate you, you know, lending your microphone over to me to to talk crypto <laughs> tax for a little bit. Um, yeah, you know, if it's you or anyone else that may be listening, you know, we're, we're always happy to to help out. Um, one last shill that I'll plug in is we also have uh, f- uh, what we call fully prepared plans. So in addition to your do-it-yourself options where you know you come in and you import and then you're done, we also offer fully prepared plans in which you can work directly with a tax professional on crypto and non-crypto accounting. I think nice. that's something that we've seen, especially for the not older demographic, but you know people that have had that have generated wealth, whether you're 30, 40, 50, 60, that have yeah. you know another business that have other assets, and they just want to have you know someone be able to handle all of that. Um, and a lot of these uh, accountants are not uh, getting sophisticated within crypto specifically yet. So the last shell I'll provide is if you need someone who can handle your crypto and non-crypto accounting, we can provide that as well and would love to be able to support you. That is fantastic. Well, I'm so glad people know about you guys. Zen Ledger, we're going to have all the information in the show notes. And I really appreciate you telling us about this as much as taxes is the most boring thing to ever talk about. In this case, it actually wasn't. <laughs> it's was actually helpful and I didn't want to fall asleep or anything. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having Zen Ledger and for bringing it to the market. Uh, seriously. Um, so I guess that's it. I'm just going to sign off. This is Dan Hannum and Monica Profit signing off on the new trust economy. We will catch you on the next episode. Thanks, you guys. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.